There is a place nearby filled with ghosts and violent echoes and broken rhymes. Like the field of a great battle after the flags have withdrawn and the dead have been carried away. Shortly after the First World War, a Canadian physician wandered the fields of Flanders where so many young men had died to end the war, to end all wars. He wrote, we are the dead. Short days ago we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved. And now we lie in Flanders fields. This is the carnage of the new Flanders fields. Thousands upon thousands killed in automobiles this year alone. As in a war, most of the young, and we grieve the loss profoundly. But what of those survivors who were so severely injured that their responses to the world about them would forever be changed? We have learned to mend the body, but what of the brain? That vulnerable, terribly delicate mechanism which lies behind the eyes. What of the mending of the shattered mind? Major accident, Northwest Highway and Midway Road. Time out, There is an irony here, and it touches again the fields of Flanders. In recent wars, Korea, Vietnam, conflicts in the Middle East, we have not only become more proficient at killing, but at saving lives as well. On the one hand, war was a lesson in destruction. On the other, a lesson in preservation. Emergency life-saving skills perfected on the battlefield are now applied with remarkable success to victims of the highway wars. Many who would once have died are now being saved and a whole new population of survivors is emerging. Coma. The word itself comes from the classical Greek concept for deep sleep. In ancient times, it was believed the moon goddess Diana watched over the affairs of one who slept so deeply. Coma, a human life hanging in precarious balance, suspended in a mysterious province science has yet to fully explore. A darkness from which many never return and those who do arrive with no memory of their sojourn there. In the most basic sense, there are two objectives, if you will, that in treating patients uh, in head injury in the intensive care unit uh, setting. One is the treatment of the pathology, the injury itself. Usually that's trying to uh, decrease the amount of brain swelling, decrease the pressure inside the head. The other, the other goal uh, is to maintain normal function that the brain is unable to do because of the injury. Uh, there's a great deal of confusion about what families expect and, and generally I think initially families expect uh, 
the patient to, to wake up as though, as though they were waking up from sleep. Coma, in, in this context, we really mean absence of arousal, uh, ab absence of consciousness in its crudest sense, that the patient uh, does not relate in any organized way uh, to its environment. You know, in general, you know that the length of coma uh, is highly predictive of outcome, but it's not so specific that a patient who's only unconscious for three days is guaranteed to make a better recovery than a patient who's unconscious for 14 days. Uh, when there's prolonged coma, that is, you know, for months, six months, the outlook is, is usually poor, but it's not universally poor. That is, patients with prolonged coma can uh, recover. Typically, the statement goes something like this. Um, when we first got to the emergency room, the neurosurgeon said to us, your family member won't live. If, they, if he does live, he'll be a vegetable. He lived, uh, he's out of coma, and he's not a vegetable, and I'm not going to believe anything you tell me about his being defective or deficient in any way. And a lot of families are able to, to really hold on to that for a long time. I think some of other families are not able to, but at the point where reality really hits, that there really has been a significant, significant change in this person, um, I think the whole grief cycle starts over. In the old Nordic myths, Odin cast a spell on Brunhilda and she went into a deep and lasting sleep. After 20 years, the hero Siegfried awakened her with a kiss. She stirred, opened her eyes, and she taught him the wisdom of the runes, the gifts of thinking, of speaking, and the power over men. Unlike the myths, where one wakes suddenly in full possession of wisdom, thinking, speaking, and power over men, for the head injury victim, these are the very things lost. And to recover them, if at all, will require years of pain and struggle, both for the patient and for the family. To those who loved him before, he is a stranger now, still loved, but also grieved. It's been no, 11 years. I still years. see him like he was, you know, before. A normal, healthy kid. How would you describe him now? Well, I think he's healthy, but he sure is normal. And he's, uh, he's very hard to understand, because as I say, one day he acts perfectly fine, the next day a little something will just start him off, and he's just very frustrated and angry. He gets very angry. and. Um, you never know when that's going to appear. You know, it just comes up. And of course, he's very hostile to people he loved all his life. It just isn't him. You know, he didn't never acted like that before. And my husband kept pulling me out that night and saying, "You must. We must leave." And I said, "No. Please don't make me leave him. Not now. Not at this point." <clears throat> and we walked out the door, and I kept thinking, "My heart really is breaking." There was such a band around it until I thought I was not sure I could get through that time, that, that one moment. I was in a rage. I was in absolute rage. I literally carried a knife in my pocket because I was staying in the Bronx where he'd mugged, where he'd gone to school. And I was hoping that somebody would just say something to me so I could lash out at them. That's how crazy you get. You want to hurt back. How could this happen? You spend your life raising a child, a perfect human being, and have him shattered. He had a good job. He had a nice car, a baby, a wife. They had just bought a beautiful three-bedroom trailer and had everything going for him, 100%, and wake up one night and it's all over. In a flash. In a flash. Like striking a match and blowing it out real quick. I guess there was a point where when Russell was first injured and he was in coma for such a long time, 
uh, being six months approximately in coma, that it was a very earth-shaking thing for me to make a decision, is Russell better off dead or alive? Many of ours have just cheers. Oh. God. There's still a lot of pain for you now. Yes. The same for everybody says when anybody gets hurt and everybody, why does it happen to me? I can't help it, honey. It's my boy. He is your boy, and you had a lot of hopes for him. God. It's all our dreams. God. Each child on earth is a poem half written, a quick, bright verse, incomplete. Robert Frost has said a poem begins in delight and ends in wisdom. But for thousands of our children, living their stanzas of delight, the end of the poem is severed from the beginning, and they are taken unaware to a world of broken rhymes. In these scenes, taken by a hidden camera, nearly a year after his accident, it seems the boy had fled, like a locust leaving merely a shell of what he had been. One wonders what he saw in the mirror. What dreams were there behind those haunted eyes? Or did he dream at all? At 19, Russell Moody was terribly injured in a car accident, and he nearly died. At first, few believed he would survive, and if he did, he would regain little more than a primitive level of consciousness. What did he see in the mirror? Was Russell Moody in there somewhere, seeking a lost road back to where we are? Okay. Soap. Soap. Good one. Sell. Sell. Good. Now I want to hear C Sam Sell Soap. Try it. <laughs> Sure. Um, mama, want to talk to Mama? Just call me Mama. Mama, oh, no, 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 no. Brushed his teeth oh, with um, the new toothbrush. Yeah, he really brushed a long time. He must have. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh huh. Um, yeah, with the Neutrogena. Uh huh. Oh yeah, he looks gorgeous. <laughs> okay. In Houston, Texas. 
there is a hospital called Medical Center Deloro, one of the nation's leading centers for the rehabilitation of brain injured persons. Here for three years now, Russell has lived his long awakening. It has been a profoundly difficult voyage of rediscovery. It's okay. Okay. Consider the brain as a marvelous computer with the directions for its use stored inside. One day the computer is dropped and is shattered. Its complex circuitry torn and interrupted in a thousand places. Not only would it be unable to process new information easily or retrieve the old, but the directions themselves would be locked away in the debris. The computer would still work, but it would work differently, imperfectly. What remained of its circuitry would be wildly unpredictable, a bewildering chaos of signals where once there was a rational and ordered universe. Russell Moody's three-year struggle has been largely to find the directions to the computer, to still and master the chaos in his mind. If we were to see with his eyes and feel the world he feels, we would find it a terrifying place to be. Everything moves slowly, as if in a dream. Simple tasks we once performed automatically the movement of a hand would require a torment of thought and planning. Images would be juxtaposed and often without focus. Our world would be filled with sound and noise, and it would be difficult to differentiate what is relevant from what is not. Each moment would be a massive effort to find meaning in the world around us. Within our minds, complex ideas and feelings cry out to be expressed yet would often get lost on the way to the tongue. For three long years, Russell Moody fought the terrible temptation to slip back into the sweet tyranny of immobility, apathy, and darkness. It would have been by far the easier course. Yet for 12 hours each day, seven days a week, he forced himself to exercise, to move, to think, to remember and to anticipate, even to enjoy. Do you remember when we first started a long time ago? Do you remember biting me? How many times did you bite me? <laughs> hmm? When you couldn't stick out your tongue or move the tongue depressor from side to side? Uh, that. Why the only thing that came with a pleasure? A pleasure? It's the only thing you had control over, right? <laughs> <laughs> Didn't stop me though, did it? No. One thing I should have is in your fingers. Russell Moody was in a coma for six months. Few who tarry so long in that dark province ever really return. Yet slowly, the person of Russell is emerging with humor, with dignity, and a kind of unexpected grace. I keep pushing Russell, but as far as I'm concerned, Russell never improved any more than what he is today. I'm happy uh, because Russell is fortunate that he still has a good mind. He can tell jokes, he's got a good enough memory, and God was great to Russell in that he spared him those things that are still, those parts of his mind that are still good for him. He's a fighter. He's come back. There's never been anything this boy hasn't tackled in his life that he hadn't been able to come through with winning colors. Like they say, cream comes to the top. 
He's always come to the top. And even in his brain injury, uh, he's been able to handle it probably better than I could have handled it. There is a further mystery here. As far as he's come, Russell's deficits are still enormous. One wonders at the outcome. What will he eventually be? Will he put the pieces of himself together to resemble something like he was before? What are some goals that you would like to try to achieve? Mm, fun. Um, um, how? There is no doubt he will walk from this place one day under his own power, that his speech will continue to improve. He will grow stronger of body and of mind. But how far, we wonder, will his progress take him? Physicians and psychologists have talked about plateaus, that his performance will peak and he will be at that point all he can be. Yet, one by one, he has passed the plateaus they have set, climbed beyond their predictions. The life of Russell Moody makes you wonder about the equations of our existence. Within the human brain, they say, dwells the apparatus of all we are. Russell's brain was shattered, yet the indomitable power of his will remains. Where then, we wonder, does the will reside? Beyond the cloistered walls of the hospital where Russell Moody heals, the world waits like a half-forgotten carousel, a carnival of sound and motion with subtle shades of sorrow and delight. To be a part of this world again is the most fervent wish of Russell and the thousands of other head injury victims who are living through the hospital experience. Yet, to survive in contemporary society requires complex intellectual and emotional skills, a very sure and certain sense of self. For head injured people, these are often the very skills their accident has stripped away. So comes the question, how shall these people now live? Traditionally, their options were few. Hidden away in the city, watching television in darkened rooms, nursing homes or institutions for the mentally ill or retarded. It's like mending the wing of a butterfly, then releasing it into an iron gray cage. If, if you think of the sort of treatments that patients go through, throughout most of the USA, throughout uh, Britain and uh, most of Europe, the early treatment and management really is superb, uh, particularly the acute management, the neurosurgical and uh, trauma nursing management uh, is excellent. There are so many good centers in the USA and, uh, and in Britain and lives are saved and they're saved with a great deal of skill and energy. And then you've got the problem of uh, acute rehab. Uh, and acute rehab is really about um, uh, arms and, and legs and you know, learning to walk and to move and uh, uh, activities of daily living uh, and, and they're extremely important. And I think we're not too bad at that. I think we've really got a handle on that. Um, down the line a little, six months on, I, I, six months is a very arbitrary sort of period, but uh, down the line a little, I think in many ways we've been rather floundering. Uh, wondering just how we begin to tackle the, the myriad of problems that face both the patient and family. Well, let, let's think of the, the main problems facing a head trauma victim who is trying to readjust back in society. Your deficits are going to be uh, in perhaps 10% of the patient's residual physical problems. 
Secondly, we've got the psychological problems that we've talked about, and these can be uh, obvious. You can have a severe memory problem, uh, and I, I mean, I, you kind of almost don't have to discuss the impact this could have on your prospects of uh, either getting a job or just dealing with other people. And then there's the extra dimension that we've talked about, and that is the psychosocial change, the emotional and the personality. Many of the patients I've known have become uh, rather isolated individuals, just, just talking off the top of my head, if I had to think of a, a problem that hits almost every patient by five years after injury, it's loneliness. In Galveston, Texas, there is a glass house filled with living green and allegory. One day soon, the plants nourished here will be transplanted beyond this small protected garden. And so they're tended carefully, prepared for the shock of transition. Those who tend the plants are a group of people who have lived through severe head injury and will soon seek roots in the real world. Thus, the allegory. It's a garden one cannot know apart from the gardeners. The place is called the Transitional Learning Community, a dramatic new trend in the rehabilitation of the head injured person. As a pilot program, it offers hope to a few whose gifts, however flawed, might otherwise be lost to us forever. This program might well spark a whole new and positive approach to rehabilitation. One of the things that makes TLC unique is our commitment to the concept of transition. We have people here who have perhaps for years seen themselves as patients and victims, uh, people for whom other people perform the uh, activities of daily living, and what we are saying here is we are taking in head trauma victims who are at the point in recovery that they are ready to give up the role of patient and the role of victim and to start taking on the responsibilities of citizenship that every adult who successfully is a member of our society has. We have a community here in which Every individual has roles, and every member here is a citizen. And we feel that this approach fosters uh, the concept of having an individual regain that sense of self-respect and self-esteem that will allow them to maximize the probability of making a successful transition. Before I was going, I was going to go to college, play football, and try to get a lawyer, a law degree, try to be a lawyer. And I was just going to shake the world and see what fell out. <laughs> the plans that you had before. Yeah. You know, it's not like you just, that that's all wiped out. You still remember all of that but then you have to accept where you are right now. I don't know the answers to those questions. I just have men to do me, and they're gonna say to me, no, you can't have a license in this state because you might have another accident, and we can't afford to have that happen. So you just have to forget about it. Well, if I can't do that, what can I do? Well, how does all this leave you feeling? Well, it leaves me on a, a little post out there in the middle of everywhere, and I don't know which way to go. I don't know what direction to go. The man with the questions holds advanced degrees in music and economics. His questions are typical of those who come for training here. What can I do with my life? How can I find my way? 
I just know that the world is broken. I don't know where to go, and I don't know what to do. I don't know what to tell you. I'm not the dealer. I'm just another player. But um, just keep plugging away. The young man with the answer is a man named Mark Barton. Before he was injured in a fall, he was an athlete of great potential. Both men are seeking to come to grips with this new person they have become and with the sudden absence of their dreams. Thoreau has said, dreams are the touchstones of our characters. If this is so, then where are we when our dreams have fled? Well, the word rehabilitation to me means kind of getting back like you were. But, the, you know, that's kind of, kind of a dream because you can't get back like you were. You, you know, I, I'll probably never run a hundred yard a kickoff back, but there's still a lot of things in life I can do. And I guess rehabilitation in, the, in my sense means making something of your life. And I'm going to try to do everything I can to do that. In an old house across the street from the transitional learning community, there is a Montessori school. Each day, Mark Barton climbs the long stairway to where the children are. A curious kinship has developed between the bright young children and the man whose intellectual skills are not what they once were. Each helps the other discover the marvelous gifts within the human mind. The children reach forward for what they have yet to know. The young man reaches backward for what he has forgotten. Mark Barton was injured at an early age, when he was just a teenager, before he'd really established an identity of who he would be as a man. And he's been struggling for five years since the injury to establish an identity. And when Mark came to us, he felt like he had two choices. He could either see himself as a wild and crazy 16-year-old, which was what he was at the time of the injury, or as a handicapped adult. And he didn't see any middle ground. What Mark has been doing since he came to TLC is finding out who he is. Not as a patient, not as a sick person, but Mark Barton, the adult, 21-year-old man. Who are you? One of the greatest tragedies of having an acquired brain damage is you had an individual who had a complete and normal life who is suddenly had this tragedy occur in their lives. And there's no way that an individual can go through a brain injury without suffering a tremendous blow to self-esteem. They suddenly uh, have problems they never had before, things that used to come easily to them uh, are difficult, friends fall away, family treats them differently. So we're looking at a, a population of people who think of themselves when they come here frequently as worthless. Now, the staff knows that each individual that comes in here is a very special person with very unique positive qualities about them. One of our purposes here is to help the individual discover those good qualities in themselves. Because if you can't identify the strengths and the good qualities, you can't use those strengths to compensate for the weaknesses. At the Transitional Learning Community, 
there is a young man named Carlos Risca. Before he was struck by a bus on a city street, he was an inventor, an electronics designer, child of the Silicon Revolution. Not long ago, he was creating electronics of enormous complexity. Now, he struggles with the directions for the operation of a washing machine. These were things that, that we used to do in, a, in a, a real automatic mode to the point that we can't really uh, remember how we actually uh, did all these things. And now trying to, trying to do them, they all seem difficult. It seems as though you're, uh, you're switching from, a, uh, from automatic transmission down to a manual. Most head injured people have difficulty with memory. Not that long term memory Aldous Huxley calls every man's private literature, but memory over the short term. That momentary and continuing correspondence we have with ourselves, a quality of mind essential to the completion of any complex task. Like our brain's cousin, the computer, we must process information step by step, always remembering where in the process we are. To most of us, this is as natural as breathing. For the head injured, it is a process which must be relearned. Before, before my accident, I got into uh, mountain climbing technology. And uh, despite the fact that I had a heck of a lot of criticism about doing something crazy. Uh, I didn't really think it was that crazy because the, the thoughts that I learned out of that were like uh, something simple, like you, you you walk up to you walk up some place and say, "Where you want to go? Want to go up there?" Say, uh, "Well, where where are you at? At the bottom. How in the heck you gotta get there?" I take that principle and use it to, uh, to life now. How in the world am I going to get there? Now I'm in, in the point of trying to, to understand what it will take to get there. Soon both Carlos and Mark will make their way out into the world from which they have been absent so long. Children, as we all are, in a strange emporium of sensation and surprise. And we wonder, how will they fare? TLC is a transition place. It's not a destination. And even after they leave here, that's not the destination, because the journey continues on. Life is a journey. And so they have to take what they have learned from being through this tremendous tragedy, turn it around and turn it into a victory. And that victory is living life and experiencing life and accepting life with all its goods and all its bads, but to accept it and to cope with it and to move on. Two young men embark on a voyage more daring than those the distant captains of Atlantis sailed in their ships with painted sails. And they sail for us. For through them we discover once again the almost magical beauty of the individual human life and the enduring power of the human spirit. Godspeed. It is morning in Manhattan, a world away from Galveston Isle. A young man does what Mark and Carlos dream. A simple thing, really. Armed with his morning paper, he goes to work. If you timed his progress from his doorstep to where he works in the Bronx, it would take about 40 minutes. 
In truth, it took eight years. David was a brilliant student in a well-known university. He primarily saw himself as a big brain and a big intellect, and he was a young, cocky fellow who felt that the world is his oyster and he's going to move places. One night, he goes from the university, from some place out of the university in a big urban area, and he is accosted by three people. They mug him, and in the process of the mugging, they smashed his head and his face, literally. For the following year and a half, almost two years, he made several attempts to go back to school and all of them failed because basically he was not able anymore intellectually and emotionally to cope with the demands of university life, which before that he could do with one hand tied, tied back. He had problems of attention, he had problems of concentration. He had problems of having lost the ability to sort of self-start, self-initiate things. And then his mother, came back into the city and literally rescued David. She found out about our program and brought him home and then almost dragged him into our program. And he was down and out. For a very long time, he didn't know what to do. And that's terrible for a young man, for anyone, but I think especially for a young man. He, um, I don't, this is very delicate ground because Shoot. I don't want to hurt you, your feelings. I'll refute them if I can. <laughs> OK. Or qualify them. See, because a lot of things that, that really bothered me before have changed. I used to watch him when, I f when we first moved here into Manhattan. He would get up in the morning, and he would start to try to take a shower, for example. And sort of all day long, he would be working toward getting, taking a shower. He'd watch television, and he'd walk around and look at the towel and get it, put it by this or put it there. And it would go on all day long, and evening would come, and he'd give up and go to bed. And then I'd see him do the same thing the next day. And I'd go absolutely mad, because I knew how frustrating it was for him, and I didn't know what to do about it. And boy, this was a far cry from the handsome kid that I knew who took several showers every day and thought nothing of it. It was just one of the things you just did, you know, as you were rushing somewhere. And here he was, just hanging out all of the time, not able to get going. Now, that is some change. And I would see this day after day week after week. His clothing smelled. I couldn't tell him that. In classical times, there was a Roman god named Janus, for whom the first month of the year is named. He served as god of gates and doors, entrances and exits. He is depicted with two faces, one looking to the past, the other into the future. David Rysick, once a promising law student at Fordham University, often perceives himself as two Davids, the old David he knew in the past and the new David he has yet to fully know. I thought I lost him for a long time. I thought he was gone. But I find he's still there. I'm still that person, changed, I do miss him in that he was a little more easily satisfied. And damn, I was a pretty boy. And considering all the operations, I should look like Clark Gable. <laughs> the old David had some darn good times. Now, I've done very well over the last couple of years, again. The new David, which rose from the wreckage of the old, is a product of his own will but he is also the product of an enlightened new concept in rehabilitation, sometimes called the regenerative option. 
people are regaining a remarkable degree of function which had been lost. Experts observe what happens, but they can't explain why it happens. There is a theory, and if the theory about David's recovery is right, it might forever change our ideas about the living architecture of the human brain. In recent years, some very interesting breakthroughs have, have occurred. Neuroscientists have found increasingly more evidence that although the brain cell itself, once it dies, it doesn't regenerate, there is an interesting process in the brain that seems to explain at least in part some of the reasons why uh, functions seem to return in people after they suffered severe head injuries. The brain consists of many, 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 many thousands and millions of cell, brain cells, that are sort of interconnected with one another at the roots. If you consider to be the cell itself, and then it has a long trunk, which is the axon, and then it has all those very fine little synapses, which are actually in a way, almost look in a sense like the roots of a tree. Now, brain cells are connected with one another, are linked up one another through these kind of root system. And so that one brain cell and another brain cell in a way meet and touch sort of at the, at the roots. Now, when a brain cell dies, apparently what has been found now increasingly that in the empty spaces where a brain cell was and died, the adjacent, the neighborly cells seem to send their roots in so that actually what happens that there is a link up of sorts between the brain cells in the empty spaces that remained, you know, as if you wish, a tree burned out. So that sort of the woods, you know, cover the empty spot and this is what the synaptic regeneration in an oversimplified version. Now David arrives at work. It has been 40 minutes, it has been eight years. It is quite probable he will not be the lawyer he dreamed to be. Yet his job as a title searcher is both demanding and productive. David Reisig is back with us at last. I would like him to be totally self-sufficient, able to take care of himself and his life. I would like him to be able to have a life for himself apart from me, for himself. I would like him to not ever feel like a dependent child, and he's felt that way for a number of years now. And I know his spirit rails against it. I want him to have his life for himself. He's a wonderful human being. Let him, for God's sakes, enjoy it. Let him not always be crippled by his insecurities and his fears. Let him do what he can do and enjoy as much as he can. I want him, I want his spirit free, you know. I always want to be there on the sidelines saying, hey kid, <laughs> go, fly, do what you can do. Don't let what's happened to you cripple you. You're on your way. When I look back now, from the first early days and now, what happened to your aerodynamia, you know, to this lack of ability to get started, it looks almost like it disappeared. Oh, it's bang, almost too good to be true. Not long ago, David returned to the program in Manhattan that made him whole. Within a small storefront building, the power of belief is a critical tool in the healing of the human mind. We do know that the psychology of belief is a very powerful component. It is well known today that if you give a person a pill that actually contains nothing in terms of chemical substance, it's a plain, it's called a placebo. Chemically, it's an inert kind of thing. It could be sugar for all you mean. But if the person believes that this pill is a good medicine, we know today that placebos have a very significant healing effect. In other words, physiologic changes 
healing changes will take place in the body if the person believes that the pill he is taking is a helpful pill. That's an aspect of belief. Now, we were born, we were human beings are capable of belief, and when you believe in something very strongly, the belief can get you to change your behaviors in a very drastic way. A lot of relief because it was finally somebody with some answers. And they can even get certain physiologic changes to occur. Gave me another chance, or just a chance. No one really truly understands exactly how this works. And it was kind of nice. I, w I finally got a chance to achieve again. This is concepts of the mind and natural sciences and uh, behavior sciences is yet to catch up, but we know that it works. Tell us now honestly and be objective. What do you think have you contributed to this new class? And what did they contribute to you? It's a very simple question. Yeah, that's like, you know, what is God? Mm -hmm. That's a simple question. It's very simple. <laughs> I just gave you honest answers. I told the truth, my situation. And if there was anything gotten out of it by anybody here, it worked. Mm -hmm. What like did it give I'm you, David? Satisfaction. You had the quality today to touch some people, and you could look at Lynn. She has tears in her. I've never seen Lynn cry. This is something. Nice of you to bring so how, it do, up. how does it feel to be a guy who can inspire other mm -hmm. people just by being? Just an extra kick I needed for a while. An extra kick. Well, you got it. Thank you very much for coming today. You're very well. Thank you. Thank you. So we count on you for a kick. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't it be nifty if I could pick my problems? So I started thinking about it, and I thought, what would I pick? Nothing can happen to me, because my kids are dependent on me. So it can't be anything that will physically incapacitate me, so it can't be me. I don't want anything to happen to my children. I really don't want anything bad to happen. Mm. What do you know? I have to take it as it comes. And that's sort of how I feel about this. Yes, I would rather have missed the whole thing. I would rather have my son not damaged. I really would. It's like being put through a damned fire, not knowing how you're going to get through it. But when you do get through, and you haven't just gotten through by luck, You've done it with sticking to what you had to do and taking care of what you had to do, your responsibilities. And you try to carry it off with a little bit of grace and a little bit of pride, and you do it day by day and see some results and know that somehow you've done something right it's a good feeling. We are, it seems, a cast of strolling players in a universal folktale, each seeking something of the heroic to enrich our lives. Yet there is something curious about heroes, something Shakespeare knew when he created Othello, Hamlet, and Lear. The essence of their heroic quality was not perfection, but imperfection. Each was given a tragic flaw. Tragic because, as great as they were, they could never rise above their flaws. And their imperfections brought the heroes down. Here now come Russell, Mark, Carlos, and David. Like the heroes of Shakespeare, each is profoundly flawed, as are we all to one degree or another. Yet here are people not diminished by their imperfections, but triumphant over them in a way that stirs the soul. And in their struggle, they reveal to all of us what is most beautiful in each of us, the will to endure, the capacity to fight the darkness that would surround us, the strength of spirit to pursue the light. We are the living, we live, feel dawn, see sunsets glow, love and our love. 
a long way from Flanders fields. Thank you.